everyone. Welcome back to Reimagine 2021 version 11, our virtual conference series, bringing you nothing but the best projects, bright minds, and leaders in the space with a focus on what's up next. And next up with us today is Justin Woodward, co-founder of TaxBit cryptocurrency software for both consumers and enterprises. Uh, they're fresh off of Utah's largest ever Series A funding round, and the IRS recently selected TaxBit to provide data analysis and tax calculation support for uh, taxpayers with cryptocurrency. That's pretty big news in the mid-year, it sounds like, Justin. Appreciate it, Miguel. It's a pleasure to be on your show and speaking with your listeners today. Excited to talk all things about the exciting things we're doing here at TaxBit and just what's happening in the crypto industry right now. You know, there's a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of hot news to discuss. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, actually, I saw a publication uh, called The Information that TaxBit also, in addition to the Series A stuff, there's another round of funding that uh, just put the company's valuation at $1.5 billion. Can, can you expand a little bit on how y'all have shot to such a, a massive valuation so quickly and, and where that money is going to be put to use? Absolutely. So I, I'm an early adopter of cryptocurrency as well as, well as many of your listeners. And at me as a tax attorney, I saw, you know, a real problem kind of with the regulatory environment with, with cryptocurrency. You know, cryptocurrency is kind of a bad name. Um, in the IRS's view, it's really crypto property, meaning that any, you know, transfer or a, a basically movement of cryptocurrency has some type of tax implication that has to be tracked and reported. And to really, you know, maintain a widespread adoption, especially on the institutional side, these tools were necessary to, you know, really track all the movement of crypto and then automate all the complexities behind the tax and accounting. So we, we serve consumers as well as enterprises. Um, so yeah, trying to make the process as easy as possible um, where crypto traders can continue to do what they love and trade in the background while we automate all the complexities behind it. So that, that was the big reason coming off these raises is, you know, to, to us without, you know, our solutions and our software, you know, cryptocurrency can't really maintain a widespread adoption because of the regulatory hurdles. And we're excited about, you know, this recent institutional adoption um, because I think, you know, our solutions on the tax and accounting side enable, enable this at scale. Yeah, that, that uh, the SEC pulling those uh, regulatory barriers away earlier in, in June, I believe is what you're referring to, isn't it there? Yeah, it's just a, a lot of complexities there. Um, just uh, definitely the accounting side, I, we could dive into all these different you know rules that we're working on, but yeah, it, it, it gets complicated really fast. And our goal too is that, you know, everyone doesn't need to be, you know, an expert in cryptocurrency taxes. Uh, we, we really built out that expertise so that we can really just automate this and then optimize on top of it. You know, our tools provide things like, you know, instead of just reporting on our taxes, how, how can we see our taxes throughout the year, you know, and even see them right within the platforms that we trade on. And then by doing that, you know, we can actually control where we end up at the end of the year. Our, our goal is to, you know, optimize taxable losses to the greatest extent for our users and provide the visibility. So, you know, a lot of times people think of taxes as a bad thing, but we, we can really optimize your taxes and let you know that, you know, if you're going to make a trade that's going to trigger a gain, that you at least do that intentionally. You know, you don't accidentally stumble in, you know, this land of, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I didn't know I entered into that transaction. And then on top of that, you know, tell users where, hey, maybe you should trade this asset today because you could realize a big taxable loss and potentially actually receive a refund back from the IRS instead of actually having to pay taxes. So those are the types of tools that, you know, tax was working on and automating to make user taxes just a friendly, uh, a friendly experience. Definitely, because like you're saying that everybody thinks about taxes in that, oh, kind of negative space. But as we move forward into that area, I've got a lot of, a lot of people in the area telling me, I'm, I'm not entirely sure when I should make those, those moves, if indeed they are aware, right, of when you can take that taxable loss. And those people are, are, are few and far between in the layman space, right? So, yeah, I, um, I, I, I would kind of refer to, I think taxes historically has been very similar to like healthcare. I mean, those are the only two industries I can think of that, you know, you really have no idea what you're going to owe at the end of the year until you get that 1099 and, you know, you plug it into your TurboTax software and, 
you know, you see, you see the wheels churning and then you, you find out for the first time, oh, this is where I landed. You know, I either get a tax refund or I owe a lot of taxes. The, the only other area I can think of that where that happens in the economy is kind of healthcare. You, you, you go into the doctor's office, you have a torn ACL, you have no idea what you're going to pay until after that surgery and you get the bill. Um, our thesis is that that's just not a good customer experience. There's no planning in that element. It's just a surprise at the end of the year. And so we're really trying to change that thesis to, you know, you don't have to wait till you get that tax from the 1099 at the end of the year. We can even tell you, you know, send you text messages on your phone. Hey, go trade this asset now and just really control the experience and make it more of an optimizing thing. You know, this is what wealthy people do. You know, you go to Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, their private high net worth practices. They are tax optimizing. They're looking for these positions to buy or sell. We're really trying to democratize those tools so you don't have to be a high net worth client with you know an institutional bank with people that do this for you. We can put these tools directly into the exchanges so that anyone can take advantage of these strategies. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, I think you said, um, I, I read something where you said that you wanted to be the SAP or you had some sort of a roadmap for tax bit, maybe not a roadmap, but that tax bit was going to or your dream was the tax bit would become the SAP of cryptocurrency. And I guess those are really the, who are, who are some other, because SAP is a little bit even kind of out there for the limit too. Who are some kind of to avoid using the turbo tax? You know, I'm sure you, you hate that. No, you know, um, I, I, SAP, obviously a large, you know, legacy provider. I, I think that's more on the accounting side. You know, SAP has, you know, these large accounting tools that they've historically you know, used for, for large corporations. The, the biggest issue is though, is they haven't built that out for the new digital economy. They, they haven't built these accounting solutions for people trading digital assets and cryptocurrency. And so we are actually a sub ledger that we can plug into any of those historical providers where, you know, you can integrate right in and say, hey, now I, I've used these historical systems, you know, to do my accounting, whether that be SAP or or others, um, QuickBooks or you know, there, there's a long list, Sage and Tac, um, and we can actually funnel all that information into these legacy systems. So you do have all you know your crypto reporting automated. Um, on the tax side, yeah, SAP hasn't been you know big on the tax side. The tax side has been you know in, in the stocks and equity world, it's historically been you know a few large providers, um, just you know a small handful. Um, Biggest issue that we saw jumping into this market, um, being a large information provider doing 1099s, is that we thought the experience was broken in legacy systems. You, they didn't send that 1099 till the end of the year, and people found out for the first time what they owe at the end of the year. Whereas Taxbit is a software provider, rather than you know just a consultancy firm, we have APIs that connect directly into exchanges and it can show you real time as you trade where your tax liability is. And so th that really is Taxbit's sweet spot is working with these large cryptocurrency exchanges and then powering full tax center suites right within these platforms. That is, that is really unlike anything that's, that's out there in the space today. That is, that is a very, very interesting idea. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's what crypto can, can enable stuff like that, that kind of, precision movement where the big guys can't really turn on a dime so quickly. I mean, crypto moves so quickly. I mean, I think we're going to get into a lot of these different discussions when you start adding in DeFi and NFTs and it, it, it's a full-time company just keeping up with how quickly the technology is moving. And, you know, that's what TaxFit has built the last few years. And that's what we continue to build. And so what your earlier question, you know, what are we going to do with this funding is, we're, we're really, you know, expanding headcount, expanding our features. You know, what, what you're going to see with this funding is you'll see more usability within our consumer product. So increased features, increased portfolio performance monitoring. But what you'll also see is in many of the, you know, largest exchanges that you use, you'll see a full tax center experience unveiled in those exchanges where, you know, if you only trade on those platforms, you don't even have to go to our consumer product. We're, we're going to put those tools innately right within the exchanges so that the experience is there and, you know, you can see everything from the same place that, you know, you're trading and buying and selling from. Of course, of course. Yes. Yeah. That, that platform integration that we all desire, right? That's, that's what, that's what ships, that's what ships these days. So I guess we're focusing on the U S uh, first. Um, 
Yeah, so TaxBit started in the United States. You know, we built out a world-class team of, you know, CPAs and tax attorneys, really ensuring the accuracy of everything we do. But we are expanding very quickly. So, you know, we're going to the United Kingdom next quarter, and then we're going to have great expansions just within the uh, European Union in general, and then Canada, Australia to come. Nice, nice. The big five. Um, I guess, so... We, we stopped on, along the way there a little bit earlier, but let's kind of get back to that. Um, there has been some talk even just recently uh, about things that aren't going to happen about capital gains. How is that derivative market, how does that affect a company like TaxBit um, when you see uh, the big banks start talking about CBDCs and things like that. What are some of TaxBit's concerns regarding uh, legacy kind of moving into, or government moving into the financial space? Yeah, TaxBit's here to really enable it. You know, we, we, we think that's a great thing, kind of bringing these legacy financial providers that, you know, may not have comfort in, in this, you know, the digital economy, to give them the tax and accounting tools to make them feel comfortable. So in the derivative markets, I, I, I think that's probably going to be a good thing for crypto in general. You know, it allows more trading opportunities. You can do more unique activities such as options and hedging. And so I, I'm hoping that that will even help, you know, stabilize the market. So it's not, um, we're seeing maybe a little less ups and downs. Hopefully we're going to get more and more of the upsides. And I, I think as we start, you know, unveiling more of those derivative tools, we might see a more stabilized market, but I definitely think it's exciting. It's unique tax implications that that we definitely have to work on with these you know new products that we're enabling for these financial institutions but i think this is just exciting to move the industry forward in general definitely definitely because as those as they those big boys come along that kind of adds to the legitimization of the space and we want to be prepared so that when governments come along the you don't get hit with that big tax bill, right? And, and, and they're coming. You know, the, these legacy financial providers, they're, they're, they have crypto strategies that they are beginning to, you know, unveil these assets to, to their clients. You know, their clients want exposure to these assets right within their portfolio manager's um, position. So I, I think that's what we're going to see a big move to next year is legacy finance really coming into crypto and embracing it, which, you know, th this is a lot different than, in 2017 and 2018, where we really saw a lot of retail adoption and retail users come in, I think what we've seen in this last year is the institutional adoption. And, and I think that's going to continue into next year uh, immensely. Yeah, so you foresee that kind of um, the GBTCs, maybe a Bitcoin ETF or crypto ETFs as the next kind of step towards the, the legacy adoption there? Yeah, absolutely. And these legacy you know, le legacy banks and brokerages um, actually releasing these products to their clients as well um, within their platforms. So I think I think we're seeing this kind of start to happen in crypto. You know, these crypto exchanges start adding more and more assets and start looking a lot more like traditional brokerages. You know, some of them are even beginning to add equities to their to their platforms. And then we're seeing on the other side, these traditional financial institutions that, you know, really started out in the equity markets moving into crypto. So we, we are seeing these platforms really embracing, hey, we want an all-in-one experience for our users. And so it, it's exciting. And it's, it, it's exciting that, you know, these, these crypto exchanges really, you know, force this to happen with their innovation and, you know, really push, push the limits of what can be done in traditional finance. And, by nature, you know, you either follow or you get left behind. And I think that's what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, isn't that, isn't that the truth, right? You either, you either swim with the big fish or, yeah, you, you know, if you're on the edge of the pack, you get eaten sometimes. So uh, I was actually about to ask about one of the big boys, the IMF, uh, labeled cryptoization as an actual a threat to the global economy after uh, the El Salvador um, adoption of Bitcoin as legal tinder. Um, that's that's going to be a big fight. What do you what do you think about El Salvador's adoption there and and the IMF fight? Yeah, you know, two two big you know questions there. I, I do think you know regulators have some concerns with digital assets, so there's no question there. And so the what we try to do is work with the regulators to put forth common sense policies to allow crypto to flourish and maintain widespread adoption, 
and make sure we avoid regulations that can potentially curtail or you know kill an industry. So I think there is a lot of worry on you know hey how decentralized finance operates right now. You know there really is no KYC. What about you know illicit activity and terrorism and those type of things? Even putting tax aside, you know having no KYC that does make you know these international and large regulatory bodies a little uncomfortable. And so I think we're going to see more regulation of just you know making sure that there's some kyc requirements uh, on these platforms so we, that they know who is trading but still allowing these you know these decentralized protocols and these unique trading platforms to operate so i, I think that's the balance that that we're striking and so i think that's where the imf's coming from a little bit saying you know in, in one state you know we are uncomfortable with this, but you know, if there are these reasonable rules and regulations, we can actually see ourselves embracing this. And I think that's kind of where, where we're going here and what we'll see. And El Salvador, but my personal opinion on it is I think this is fantastic for El Salvador. You know, I, I think it's gonna be a net benefit for their population, for their people. You know, I, I think in you know, wealthy countries, you can take for granted things like inflation. You can take for granted things like a lack of a bank account even you know in el salvador it's 30 to 40 percent of people have a bank account and so the idea being like how can you ever really you know have uh, you know savings and really think about the future when you know you're stuffing money under your mattress and that type of yeah. thing if you embrace bitcoin you know if you have a cell phone you have access to banking now through through these new financial products. And so we don't need to go get a physical branch and put them in all of these locations for these people to have banking services. Let, let's, you know, allow access. And if we can get everyone in the world a cell phone, they have access to banking now. And, and I think that really should be kind of our, our mission to really, you know, solve a lot of these global financial crises. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do agree with you in the first world. Um... Uh, even basic infrastructure, things like paved roads, um, running water, uh, a lot of places down there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it is rough. So uh, I, I do, I do, I think, I, I think I agree with you. Um, and, and then the big boys. Being, yeah, being the first person to embrace it too, like El Salvador. <laughs> like, I think, you know, I think we believe and your users believe that, you know, we're going to see great increase in the price of Bitcoin. You know, we are just at the heels of institutional adoption and to allow a poorer country such as El Salvador to, you know, embrace this early, you know, they, they may be big winners here. And so I, I think that we might see some other poorer countries that don't have stable, you know, fiat currencies and don't can't really fully rely on it start to embrace you know, digital assets and crypto, crypto assets in general. And I think we'll see that will be you know, a great net benefit to their populations. Yeah, I do. I think I agree with you that I think in places where maybe even uh, democratization just in general, um, not even a finance, but just in general has been uh, iffy the last hundred years. I, I do think, and, and one of the ways that we could do that with his DAOs um, in places like Venezuela, what, what do you think um, about things like DAOs in terms of bringing that kind of change? I, I think DAOs are, you know, fantastic. You know, it's so, such innovative products and technology. I think the last 10 years, we've seen more of an advance in our financial infrastructure and our financial systems than we've seen, you know, in the last 30 years. It's kind of the pace of, of adoption and you know DAOs and smart contracts and just decentralized systems in general uh, allow you know greater transparency and you know public decentralized ledgers and help avoid things like you know central control which which can create problems as we're saying you know it can create inflationary problems for for your currencies and it can allow you know some countries to manipulate their currencies through their central banks than more than maybe other countries do and it can cause large problems and, and it doesn't really make sense for each country to have their own their own currencies you know it, it as we get more and more towards globalization i i think this is just inevitable that you know there are going to be more competing currencies and those competing currencies won't be you know centralized back currencies by one government oh yeah definitely i i do i do think that um Countries' lines were drawn at a certain time, and as we move forward through history, the reasons for those lines change. And and I do think that because I did I did go to Mexico recently, and I use crypto heavily down there in places where I couldn't even use a credit card. 
So, I mean, yeah, you know, in Mexico, in most transactions are still cash transactions. So I think we're going to just see a boom of, you know, these are early days. This this makes sense to really move, you know, these countries to to a digital economy. And you know, to that point, even going back to your point on, you know, borders and and what what is currency? You know, there was a time in you know the United States history that each state was issuing its own currency. Um, does, does that make sense? I mean, maybe it, it didn't really make sense at the time. We, we saw it break down and move towards, you know, more of a federal system because some, you know, states, their currencies couldn't be trusted. And, you know, there's just so many of them. And how do we, how do we balance this? And so I, I think that was kind of the first move of, okay, let's, let's create like, you know, a central, you know, a federal reserve and authority here. But I think we're, we're even moving beyond that now at this point. Like we're moving beyond countries with international trade and, you know, such a borderless list system that it, it makes more sense than ever to, you know, really create the next, you know, legacy financial system. Yeah, I do think, I think that idea of that DAO was actually probably best inhabited, not by something in the crypto space, but by those guys over on Wall Street bets. Like that's just essentially a DAO is, you know, hey, we're all going to vote on this and they're just doing their, their, voting with actual US dollars and the price of AMC instead. But <laughs> it gets it gets demonized in legacy finance. But if you buy into it and you know that that's what's going on starting out, I, I don't I don't understand what's wrong with that. You know, it's it doesn't it seems more fair to me than the way things are run right now. Yeah, I, I, I think the point being just, you know, be careful with, you know, what you're buying and selling. I think there is that consumer element of, yeah, you could buy products that, you, that are inherently risky and, you know, lose a lot. Do I, do I think Bitcoin or Ethereum is one of those products? Maybe short term, but, you know, long term, these assets are, you know, they have so much behind them that I think, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're not properly leveraging yourself if you don't have at least some exposure to these digital assets, especially with the level of inflation that's happening. You know, I've heard, you know, some say that, you know, 5% of a corporation's balance sheet should be in cryptocurrency or else they're just at huge risk of inflationary pressures. So you should hedge a little bit to you know, really follow this, the system, what we're doing. <laughs> that's crazy. That's insane. I've never heard that. That, if anything else, like that'll leave you with the uh, the legacy finance, like putting their, if, if, if it really is like five percent, that's, that's insane. That's amazing to hedge your bet right there with that it, it, kind of it, as a speculative play. Yeah. I mean, I mean, before it was viewed as just a huge risk to, you know, buy into these different digital assets. They didn't quite reach adoption yet, but I think we've kind of hit that inflection point in the last year that, all right, if you don't buy this asset, you might be at, you know, big risk. <laughs> and so it's kind of weird seeing that transition happen. So let's, let's round on probably an area in the crypto space that um, a lot of people, even in, in crypto are kind of trepidatious about. Let's, let's talk a little bit about NFTs. Um, I, I know that the big thing right now is all about the digital art, but maybe you can speak a little bit towards actual legitimate uses of nfts even in legacy finance sure yeah nfts are just taking off lately it's just so exciting seeing the pace of adoption and you know there's always something new that you can create with blockchain technology so and nfts i i do think art is a legitimate use case for nfts you know is some of it in a bubble maybe um but it is cool seeing like a tokenization of a single asset. It's kind of more unique. We've seen, you know, earlier days of crypto, it, crypto was more fungible. I'm like, let me get some Bitcoin, a piece of Bitcoin. And that NFT actually allows you to own the entire piece of something, you know, even that it's a digital piece of art. And I think what's going to be exciting here is just the, how you can expand the use cases here, you know? Why don't we tokenize real estate, you know, real assets backed by this? I, I think this is the next progression of NFTs of where we're going. And then we can even, you know, make real estate divisible. You know, what, what if I, there's some companies doing this right now. What, what if I want to own 10% of a house in Detroit? You know, you, you can do that. You can actually buy a piece, a coin that represents, you know, a 10% interest in that property. I think that's, that's what's going to be so exciting about, you know, digital assets and nfts that that kind of evolution of just tokenizing something 
and putting on the blockchain and allow that to be, you know, your ownership of that property. That's yeah, that's actually really exciting because I know a lot of uh, people that I talk to, a lot of people my age, always are, are they want to get involved in their community, but they don't know how. And that's probably the easiest way that I've ever thought of or ever even heard of, other than hey, you know, go help out at the soup kitchen, you know. Uh, so that's that unbelievable, amazing um, times that we're living in here. Uh, what about the art stuff right now? What about the art stuff? Do you think that the gener generative art has a has a has a longer lifespan than this, or are we just going through a Picasso moment? Well, I definitely think it has a longer lifespan than this. I, I think what we're going to continue to see is more and more platforms will be able to, you know, actually trade NFTs on. It's going to become easier to create NFTs and, you know, that process is going to, you know, simplify what that's going to do to the price of NFTs. You know, I, I think that's to be determined. I, I think NFTs are here to stay and they're going to be even more easily accessible. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's hard to say that like, you know, some assets you can point to a single NFT and say, you know, that NFT is worth $20 million. It, it's just, it, it's hard to value because, you know, it isn't fungible. It's, you know, it, there's one of them in, in the world. And so I think that's what makes it a, an interesting, you know, paradox. But, um, you know, some, sometimes there's some level of risk that you might want to take to get some exposure to the market too, because, at, we we don't know which direction NFTs are going to go on price. Oh yeah, sure. The the analogy that I like to make too with people that come out with the uh, all the poo pooing it straight off the bat is, well, some houses are worth a lot and some houses aren't worth very much, and some houses are worth a whole bunch, but there's a lot of debt on the deed, and that's what the NFT actually is. Is that's it's the deed to the house. It's the deed to the house exactly. That's that's your ownership of. Of the property and i mean how, how cool is it that you can put that ownership into you know a single asset and that be so transferable across you know even across the world you know selling it to someone who's just in a completely jurisdiction different jurisdiction um such exciting use cases here oh yeah absolutely yeah definitely i do think um that tax bit on a place like Op uh, open c or another nft market integrated into would be uh, definitely help drive the long-term uh, efficacy of NFTs for sure. And we, we have some exciting announcements that we're going to be coming out very soon here on, you know, the NFT support uh, for this through, you know, just making the taxes completely transparent. So users know but the, the thing that I hate the most is just when users don't know implications while they're trading and then just find out at the end of the year, like, oh, I'm trying to re-piece this all together. And oh, if I would have done this one thing differently, I, I wouldn't have made that trade or I wouldn't have done done this. So I, I think that's what we're really that's what we're really working on is making that just simple where you know users can tax isn't a worry on NFTs. You you know what you're getting into. So absolutely. Since we stopped by it like once or twice, and I know this makes me rip my hair out whenever I see it quickly. If, if you can, what are like the number one or two biggest ways that people don't know that they're about to get taxed in a crypto transaction? Yeah, it, it, it's education. You know, I think most of the time uh, where you might realize a substantial taxable event is just in the selling process of a cryptocurrency. So, you know, I bought this Bitcoin in 2015, you know, I sold it. To just maybe I'm even trading it for another cryptocurrency um, might not be a good idea. It, you might want to go trade a more recent asset that has you know a lower uh, or a higher cost basis so that you can control your tax liability. So that's definitely one. And then the the other is just interest generating activity. You know, like things like staking or or mining. You know, th that is reportable as well. Yeah, I think that's the big one that a lot of people forget about is hey, I've got this thing that's been sitting on you know, an AMM or a yield farm forever, and then they pull it out and they sell it. And they're, they're pretty, pretty nervous about, hey, I forgot to, because now the IRS is asking people to declare all that stuff, or they have been at least for a year now. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're asking for the declaration so that, you know, they can prove that questions really aimed at improving intent. Like, if you answer no on that question, you actually did 
trade, you know, cryptocurrency activity. Now, now the IRS can prove that you intentionally, you know, didn't comply with your burden, which you can't claim ignorance anymore, which, which ignorance isn't an excuse under the law. Right. But uh, <laughs> if, if you can prove intent, you know, those, those penalties can get higher. It can become more dangerous. It can potentially turn into, you know, a criminal case. Um, and so it really is, you know, just take it seriously to the same way you take, you know, when you trade stocks and equities, you know, you're, you are paying taxes on that. You, you get that information reporting the 1099s from the exchanges. We're, we're going to start seeing that a lot more in cryptocurrency where, you know, these platforms are uh, with this new infrastructure bill, these platforms are actually issuing these 1099s to the users. And so it's not, it's just not going to be an option anymore, but you know, at the same time, I think these clear rules and these boundaries, I think that's what's leading to institutional adoptions. Uh, institutions, large, you know, banks, financial institutions, they, they don't want to live in a, you know, uncertain regulatory environment where they may not know what they're, what they're getting into. You know, a lot of these are public companies. They have to, you know, report accurately. And so when we see more clear rules and more helpful reporting, I think that actually is going to boost crypto assets beyond what what we even think is imaginable or capable. It's, it's really bringing these assets from the fringe and bringing them into mainstream finance. <laughs> I'm for one, I'm very, very excited. I am very excited because I do think that as, like you say, as the path gets clearer for the big boys to come into the space, we'll see a bigger, a bigger, um, um, boost, even if in the short term, all that it seems like are being made is rules. Um, uh, because I think that people forget, like you said, that the big boys, they need things to be uh, equitable for them more so than for us. And they don't want to risk. So 5%, that's, that's a big, big, big I mean, deal. We, we need institutional adoption. You know, if you, you want Bitcoin to really rise, it, it's not going to be on purely the consumer's back. It, it's going to be large corporations putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet and, and, and that we will see prices rise as that happens. And that's going to increase adoption. But my, my thesis would be get it, get in early, get, get in now. It, it, it still is, you know, just my advice, but it still is early. And as we're seeing this institutional adoption, they're going to greatly benefit the first movers here and, you know, beat, beat them <laughs> would be my advice. Nice. Well, it would, yeah, early bird gets the worm. That's what they say, right? That's right. Yeah, yes, sir. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's what we've got for you today. That's Mr. Justin Woodward out of TaxBit. They raised the largest uh, Series A funding in Utah's history. And he says that we have big news coming for you soon. Um, Justin, thanks. It's been a great talking with you today and uh, hope you uh, tell us what that news is soon. Thanks, Miguel. Appreciate speaking to you and your viewers.